I was too firm, I was too hard. If players were one minute late and all these things, I was fighting a culture instead of just being myself and being a bit more relaxed of it. Um, and in the second year, I really relaxed a bit more. And I let them come to me a little bit more in terms of, well, if they want help, they need to come and approach me instead of me trying to push them. I think if you look at the best, best, best coaches, they're doing it. I think you watch Klopp, his relationship with the players. I think you watch Pep, his relationship with the players. They're doing it. They're making their people better. They're making their players better. So, Jack Brazil, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Christy. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. My first question is, I want to bring you back to the start of your journey. How did football become a passion for you? Uh, yeah, I think the first memory I have of football is Michael Owen scoring against uh, Argentina in the 98 World Cup. Um, and I just fell in love with him. Um, I thought he was brilliant. He was 18 years old and I was four and a half, nearly five. And it was all I ever wanted to be was to be the striker who scored for England because I saw the adulation. I saw everything around how great and how revered he was at that time. And um I remember my mum went and I think she was going to get me an England shirt with Owen on the back, but inadvertently the only one with Owen on the back at that point was a Liverpool shirt. So I became a Liverpool fan. Um, and then ever since then, it just it, it spawned into this addiction. Um, and it wasn't just Liverpool. That was the addiction. It was everything. I had every single team in the Premier League. I had their football album, their annual. Um, I was obsessed. I started playing championship manager, I think when I was six or seven. Um, and it was... A full-blown obsession and I enjoyed playing but my father um, had retired he was playing uh, when I was very very young I don't remember it and he started coaching and uh, my first memories of football are going with him to where he used to work at Notts County and I would be the spare player on the side ready to jump in at any point and I saw him coaching and I think by the time I got to 14 15 the idea of being a player being realistic, I knew really how much demand, how high the demands were to become a professional player because I'd seen it through my dad and the players he was coaching and I realised I wasn't that good. Um, so I really started to change my attention and uh, and focus on coaching and 16 years old then uh, I really focused on becoming a coach and, and doing that the best I could. So I think that would be the way it started, Michael Owen, and then it sort of snowballed into something bigger by the age of 16. What is it about coaching that you enjoy the most? You mentioned, obviously, your experience with your father and being exposed to maybe different types of people and different types of environment. Why coaching and, and why is that a passion for you? Yeah, the first reason I went into it was because I wanted to win. Like I think any coach does. I think you become obsessed with winning. So I was the worst under-15 coach like you could ever imagine when I first took a team at 16. We were the worst team in Nottingham. Um, but then as it grows you understand what the purpose of it is and, and the most satisfaction I get now when I look at uh, the players I've coached and I've been fortunate enough to work with are the ones who've gone on to make a really good life for themselves and most of them have gone to make a really good life for themselves away from football and some have gone into coaching and some have gone into um, into like semi-professional playing or they're studying at university. They give me the most pride because they've gone on to be good people and they've gone on to have a really, really good life um, and they're building something for themselves and that, that's really the crux of it. You can only push someone so far and you can only get so much out of their technique and their ability, but you can really help them with their mindset. During that process for you, you mentioned um, wanting to be a coach at a young age, watching football on the TV, more glowing, and then getting the opportunity to coach. Was there anyone that was inspiring for you? Was there a mentor or anyone that you went to in terms of guidance to become good at the, the practice of coaching? And obviously, obviously, it's really easy to say my dad, but he had a massive, massive, massive influence on me. Um, I was obsessed with with being like him. Um, I think as a young kid, and as as time went on, he was a real mentor to me. But then, if I talk away from it, it's probably away from him. Um, people that really mentored me to sort of light that fire, John Griffiths. Um, it's another crazy story. Um, John was doing my youth modules when I was eighteen, nineteen. Uh, the old youth modules and uh and he was excellent for me he really sort of lit that spark and sort of sent me on a journey away from winning gone to creating an environment how does coaching actually look and 
And just by complete coincidence, four years later, he became my sister's national team coach for the under-17s. So then I went out to watch her play and he would invite me to training. And He was a really good mentor for me. Um, and I really enjoyed working with him. And then away from that, when I was in Norway, I had a really, really good mentor in Gard Holmer. Um, Gard was superb in teaching me um, sort of the, 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 the technical and I'd say more scientific background of coaching and how we can structure things for the, for the mental, cognitive, physical and interlink them because there's no way of pulling them apart. And he taught me how to really organize that. And I'm really glad to see the success he's gone on to have himself in his coaching career. Um, and then if you watch TV and those guys, it's not a mentor, but it's a role model. I was always in love with Mourinho. Um, I thought he was fantastic because I could relate to him. He was the same as me. He wasn't quite good enough to have a career. He had to cut something out of himself. He had to carve something um, out of nothing. And yeah, I, st I still think he's fantastic. Just on that, Jax, what do you think the best way of obtaining knowledge is? You mentioned formal education, observation, maybe informal conversations with your dad, etc. cetera. Um, different cultures as well. You mentioned Norway. What, what do you think the best way of, of obtaining knowledge and information has been for you during your journey? Yeah, I think there's obviously there's, there's two ways to use information. It's like an intake. You can consume, 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 consume. And I do that with reading quite a lot. Um, but then you have to implement and you have to find the right way of implementing and see what is successful and what is congruent with your personality and your way of being. So it's okay saying, oh, I want to be this type of coach. But then if it doesn't fit with your personality, it's not authentic. The players won't believe in it. So the key thing is consuming and making sure you take on a lot of information. So that can be informal conversations, formal conversations, formal education, um, badges, um, reading, all these different areas you can learn from. But then the key thing is making it authentic to yourself and then applying it and really reflecting on the application as what, what do I look like? What, who do I want to be? And how is my coaching personality authentic in relation to my actual personality? Um, cause I, I've done both. I've been inauthentic to myself. Um, and the players, I wouldn't say they smell it for a mile off. I think that's quite an easy phrase to use, but after three or four months, it actually becomes really tiring for yourself to be a different person. And you have to just go sod it. I'm going to be myself. Um, and that, those moments are the moments where you get the best connection with the players. Did you think that's a hard process? Again, just to some reflection of yourself, but even you know, me just thinking about academic and academic work and applying certain knowledges, etc. It can be um, it can be a challenge to actually find out what's right and what's useful, and that authentic authenticity seems to be the key catalyst there in terms of what you said, but. Do you think that's a challenge for coaches in terms of there's so much out there, there's so many different styles, there's so many personalities that they try and implement a certain thing that they've seen, but it's important to be yourself to to ensure that you get the best out of your players, but also prove a point to yourself that you have the capability of being who you are and being a coach? Yeah, I've got two things that I'll, I'll touch on here. The first one is my experience. Um so when I first moved to the Cayman Islands, I was 22 years old and I took a men's team there um, that was semi-professional in inverted commas. I think we gave a few players a car and some people had jobs with the owner of the club, etc. It wasn't semi-professional at all. It was a completely amateur team, but it was beautiful in what it was. Uh, 14 teams on island, so it gave them the opportunity to sign players, do all those things. Um, and in the first year, I had to try and professionalize things so heavily um, I kind of lost my personality in it because I almost became a bit of a police officer um, to try and professionalize things so quickly. Um, and I lost myself. Uh, I didn't get on with the players as well as I wanted to. I didn't have the same relationship with them. I was too firm. I was too hard. If players were one minute late and all these things, I was fighting a culture instead of just being myself and being a bit more relaxed with it. Um, and in the second year, I really relaxed a bit more. And I let them come to me a little bit more in terms of, well, if they want help, they need to come and approach me instead of me trying to push the, the help on them because that was almost the police officer approach I had in the first year and the standards and values they had to set it. And if they weren't wanting to buy in, that was their decision, not mine. And I would reflect that in the 
uh, in the team selection and also it would reflect itself in the team performance and the second year was so much more successful because of that and the relationship I had with the players was so much tied to and I, I recognized I made mistakes in that but I was authentic to be in myself and I could then go guys I made a mistake I messed up instead of no I didn't make a mistake I'm always right I'm the law um, so I think that would be the first point that was a really strong experience for me when I reflect upon it and then the second would be um, I've been on two of Rema Behind's courses now and he's a very very divisive figure but what I will say for him is he goes really deep and if you can prove him wrong he will accept it and then we'll find out what's right. And it's not about being wrong. It's not about being right. It's about finding the truth in something. So you really dig deep for a week and you're up all hours. There's 20 hour days, but you talk about what's the truth in football. What's the truth in the way we communicate? And that's a really different way of doing, um, I'd say an experiment. And it is, it's a football experiment for a week. We find out how much we can learn across the week. It's tiring. It's really difficult. But then you come out with it with these truths of what are true. But then he always says at the end, but this has to fit with you authentically, your personality and your context. If you come in and you do all these things uh, that we spoke about as truth and the way we train, 100% everyone in the club is going to go, he's been on a course, what an idiot. And you're going to get cast aside. So you have to be smart in how you bring things into your context. And that's about being authentically yourself and not losing who you are, even though you might know something which is um, better than what you're doing already. How is that course as well as experience shapes your leadership and I'm intrigued more from a cultural point of view because we'll talk about your journey um, across Europe and across the world in a moment but how is your leadership within that from those practices that you've learned is there anything that stands out that you think is valuable to you and you hold as a as a true value within your your practice yeah um, the, the key thing and this is quite non-Dutch, so I, I find this quite difficult where I am um, at times, but also I have to adapt to them, so that's another way. It's probably another thing you can put straight away, uh, straight away is ava uh, adaptability, availability of yourself and giving yourself, making yourself available to change and be adaptable to what you're in. But I'm always trying to find the strength. So I get told here, I say, well done and good job too much. Um, but I'm always trying to highlight and find the people that are doing things really well as you want them to do instead of finding the people who are doing things wrong that you don't want to do. So then you lead the environment towards success and what the success looks like, uh, look like and how people are going to um, follow that in place of um, negatively speaking about other people um, at the bottom of the group or that are struggling or are not doing as you say. <clears throat> so that that would be one thing that's really key for me and I particularly learned that probably in the second year in the Cayman Islands and the first couple of years in Norway is focus on the ones who are doing it right and and the rest will follow. And if they don't, they're going to drop off. Um, and it's almost their natural selection. But if you go for the bad players and you're always trying to affect those and the ones, and I, by bad players, I don't mean bad in talent and in technique and in quality. They can actually be at the top of the group. But if their behaviors and their way of working is bad, then you're just fighting and losing battle. Focus on the guys who are doing it right focus on those players, focus on those boys and girls who are really, really pushing the group in terms of standards, values, the way you want to train, the intensity, the attitude that you want to hold and being authentically themselves uh, and giving themselves in every instance. They might make mistakes, they might mess up, they might make really, really difficult decisions um, in situations where there's an easy decision there to be made. However, the key is that they're the ones that you focus on and lead and hopefully the rest will follow. And if they don't, it's natural selection. You mentioned Cayman Islands, Norway, and obviously where you are now in the Netherlands. What, how did international come, uh, how did international coaching come about? Can you tell me a little bit about of what your outlook towards traveling and experiences new experiencing new cultures was like for you? Um, yeah, uh, so twenty eighteen, I finished school um, sixth form. I really didn't enjoy it. I didn't have a good experience at school. It wasn't something I really felt an affinity to. I felt a real affinity with coaching and improving myself in that way. So I decided that I wanted to travel and I've always loved traveling. I've always loved seeing new places. It was something that's really important to me um, to understand different people. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in quite a multicultural area as a kid and 
people would always talk about home and and the countries their parents came from and i was a bit envious i wanted to see something else i was bored of nottingham i was bored of where i grew up um and that's not to say it's a bad city but there was a an element of i want to see more and um i had a year out between uh sixth form the end of sixth form and and, and university so 18 to 19 i didn't have anything to do so i emailed every single football association in the world um and i'm sorry if you receive one of those emails from me um and i'm also a little bit angry because i only got two replies ever um and uh i got uh i emailed pretty much every first or second division club in any countries i was interested in visiting and i got three replies um including the two from the football associations one was the Turks and Caicos Islands Association one was American Samoa and one was a guy in Mongolia um and uh in the end I went to Mongolia at the end of my first year of university uh, and coached there in the Premier League at that point um and it just it just started it for me I was like yeah this is for me um this is so different the, the whole thing around it it's so 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 different to coaching in England and I'm really intrigued to see more so the next summer I took my football team of university to the Turks and Caicos Islands we played all the nationalities that we played the national team there we took the national teams um, for three weeks which is amazing I went to Gibraltar in Spain and coached there and then at the end of my university I got offered a job in the Cayman Islands um, again through emails through LinkedIn I just offered myself and I got a two week camp in the Cayman Islands I went out and did it did really well and they offered me a full-time job and that just rolled into another thing and it rolled into another one that rolled into Norway that rolled into the Netherlands and um yeah I, I just enjoy that feeling of right I'm not very good at this I don't know the language I don't know what's happening but when I come out the other side of it in a year and a half two years time I'm gonna be so much better as a person as a coach what was it about the culture then that enabled you to adapt you mentioned Cayman Islands and other environments where you, you've been in and you, your words were you have to adapt to the culture adapt to them how do you do that how, how is that achieved oh it's a tough six months it always is a tough six months um the Cayman Islands I suppose you have to drop ego and everything around that kind of mindset of yours and and being open to do new things I'm just intrigued on that process yeah, it is really hard because uh, I've said this a few times. Um, when when I went to the Cayman Islands, I had all the answers, um, and I was going to bring the answers from England to the Cayman Islands and educate the country, and we were going to succeed and win everything. But the truth is completely the opposite. Um, they taught me a lot more than I ever taught them, um, and. The, the the key was understanding what was really important to them. So we had a lot of things like lateness was really big there. So players, if I called training for 6.30, I'd be lucky to get everyone there before 6.45, 6.50. And some players would still be turning up at 7.15. Um, and we think, whoa, uh, that, that's not right. Yeah, but they live on an island where everyone lives the same. You don't live by the clock. You live by, okay, I need to get this done. And it's like, and when you look into the history of it, it comes from the seafarer days where they just waited until the sea was right for them to go out on their boats because if it was too choppy, they couldn't go out on their boats. So they would wait. So they weren't on the clock. They were just waiting for the correct moment to do things. And it's just ingrained in their culture of, yeah, it'll be done when it gets done. And that leads into the guys who are working as cleaners, the guys who are working at account accountant firms, to the guys who are at school. It gets done when it gets done. And I'll be there when I'm there. And so then I had to adapt myself and be like, right, well, if I start the session with seven and then I have 11 by 15 minutes and then later than that, I'm going to have 20. How do I make sure that I can always have an effective exercise that's teaching what we want to teach um, ahead of the game on Saturday? And it was so annoying. I, it was so difficult, but I had to adapt and I had to learn to adapt to, to that. And the appreciation I got from the players for that uh, because I adapted to that was perfect and and little things like uh, that I used to do um, with them I used to go to their restaurants with them I used to go to um, their family things I used to go and hang out with them in their spots and instead of and the Cayman Islands is 30,000 people expat 30,000 people companion instead of going and being an expat and hanging out with the Brits and the Americans and the people I was comfortable with I spent 95% of my time with the uh with the companions and 
And, and I think they appreciated that and they saw that I really bought into them. And I tried to always do the same wherever I went, um, in Norway, in the Netherlands. And you end up with your, you end up with your foreign group. You do get that with your, your British or your American, your, your cultural group where you're comfortable with. But you do spend five, ten percent of your time with them. The other ninety percent, you have to really adapt yourself to the people that you're with and drop your identity of being British and adopt your identity of being an adopted Kamanian, adopted Norwegian, or adopted Dutch person, and recognise what they do and do it. And did you learn language through that process, Norway and and the Netherlands? I'm sure you immerse yourself in language and and, and try to to integrate via that way. Do you, do you practice? New languages? Yeah, yeah. So I speak enough Norwegian. Um, I was quite comfortable coaching in Norwegian, a lot more comfortable than I am in now in Dutch. Um, Norwegian's an easier language. Um, Dutch Dutch has been a difficult challenge, but I think I'm I'm a lot closer than where I was six months ago. I've really died, uh, sort of dove into that challenge over the last six months and really pushing myself with it. I've always been competent, probably since... January 2022, so six months after I moved here, I, I went on a course and I did a lot of work on it and I got myself to a specific level and now I've, I've stepped on. Um, and that's not to say I'm perfect at either, but I can communicate very clearly. I can make myself clear on a football pitch. Um, I can explain everything that I need to. If a player needs backup in Dutch or Norwegian, I can explain it to them in the, both languages. Um, if the, my English doesn't come across clearly, I'm quite lucky in that in Norway, um, I took the under 12 group and I spent the first three months practicing Norwegian and coaching them in Norwegian. And after three months, three of the under 12s, considered they're 11 or 12 years of age, came up to me and said, Jack, we really appreciate you trying Norwegian, but we'd like you to coach us in English, in fluent English. And that was a real, um, <laughs> was a real <laughs> sort of sobering moment that these 11, 12 year olds, English should come ahead of my Norwegian, but it was also me having to adapt. Again, they wanted me to do it in another way. Okay, I'll do it in English if that's what you need. And then I can back you up in Norwegian if you need that as well. And, and that's also happened in the Netherlands. Um, I tried everything in Dutch and, and you open yourself up to criticism. You open yourself up to being really vulnerable. And uh, the academy director said to me, look, Jack, really appreciate the effort you're making. However, I really want you to do it in English from now on for, for your own personality, for your own way of... Um, explaining things and if you need to explain things one-to-one two-to-one or with units yeah, do it in dutch but when you're leading a group i love your english voice do it in that and and that's uh that's been a challenge and, and even in the cayman islands we had several jamaican players um speaking patois to each other so i needed to understand what they were saying to each other because they speak a completely different grammar to english when they speak we had spanish um, costa rican honduran players in uh in, in the Cayman Islands as well within our team. So you have to have an understanding of everything. And even in our group now in the, in the Netherlands, we have Spanish players that come and visit, Mexican players. I went to Korea recently. I don't speak any of those languages fluently, but I have enough to be able to communicate, ask how they are, ask how they slept. How, what did you have for dinner this mo- uh, dinner last night, breakfast this morning? Little, little, little pieces which help you build a relationship. And then you can go into English because those little things are really, really important when you have a relationship with a kid that you can express yourself in their native language. Is there anything that you've learned during that period of of traveling and and working in different cultures and different people and expressing language and changing identity and and, and trying to build a relationship with, with people that you wouldn't have learned in the UK? Is there anything that stands out during your experience on reflection that you think, this is what I've learned and if I was to stay in Nottingham or was to stay in the UK and apply my trade in academy football there, I wouldn't have had this outlook towards coaching or the world. Is there anything that stands out in that in that regard? I really know and I really notice why people are different now because I see the environments they grow up in and how varied they are. I think if I continued to stay in Nottingham, they'd be from different places and different like towns or areas in Nottingham. And yeah, you might have a bit of a different upbringing, but it's 90% the same. There's not that much difference. People aren't, um, I say this very, very generically, 
when people aren't in situations where they're really struggling to eat, et cetera, et cetera, there's the, there's the people that are struggling and that's terrible. But on the whole, you're looking at a population which is pretty well looked at. And we're, we're pretty, we're, life's pretty good. But then you go to the Cayman Islands, yeah, there were people living in my team that were living in shacks. Um, and you're looking up the road at multi million pound businesses. And at one point, I had a goalkeeper for my team, still speak to him now, great, great lad, uh, English. And he was earning a lot, a lot of money uh, working for a, a business in the Cayman Islands. And he was also the same as me, expatriate, grew up in Britain, moved for a job. Um, but then at the same time, I had a kid who was struggling to get through school because he couldn't pay for his books. How how do you manage that? How do you manage such different lifestyles and such different backgrounds? Um, I don't think I'd have experienced that in the extremes that I experienced it with so many different backgrounds within the team. People growing up in different countries and different environments and different languages, completely different cultures, and then you've got to bring them together in a team. That was a real, real challenge. And in Norway, I was treated to another thing. We had 20, no, 32 players, sorry, um, in my under 14s and 28 of them didn't have two, uh, didn't have two Norwegian parents. There was only four players in the team who had both parents Norwegian. The other ones had maybe a Bosnian parent and a Norwegian parent or a Somali, uh, two Somalian parents or a Pakistani parent and a uh, Norwegian parent. So many different cultures in one team. So then I had to know, well, what do you eat at home uh, to my Somalian player? And in comparison to a Norwegian player, that's a big difference in their diet. There's a big difference to the time they went to bed. There's a big difference to when they woke up in the morning. How do you deal with those things? Oh, okay, I've got seven Muslims in my team. They've got to pray during Ramadan. They're not eating during Ramadan. How do I incorporate them with the guys who are on a normal Norwegian schedule? That's, uh, that's a challenge that I don't think I would have got in the same extremes in Nottingham. I'm not saying I wouldn't have got a challenge like that, but the same extremes, nowhere near. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting how that's opened your mind towards different cultures, different ways of life, um, and it's challenged you to, to maybe adapt your outlook towards the world as well. Would you agree with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And never judge someone as you take them. Like their attitude and their behaviours might be because, or they're, they're not. Might be a hundred percent. They're because of something. And we have a, a, a couple of players in the academy now who are adopted from. Um, from different poorer third world nations within in the world and they've moved to the Netherlands and they live with the Netherlands or a Dutch family I should say but they still have contact with their old family back in in their, in their home country how do you deal with that how do you yeah. how do you make him realise that he can trust you yeah that's a really really difficult thing because he's always been searching for trust and belonging at home and what is home to him and yeah, that, that's, that, 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 that leaves with a lot, that leaves me with a lot of questions. And I spend a lot more time reflecting on that and how I'm going to build a relationship which is sustainable and continuous with, with that player in place of how does our 4v2 rondo look like next week? Well, that was going to bring me to my next point because there's this fixation when people get into coaching that they have to develop a style of play or think about technical and tactical abilities. But from your perspective, then it's more looking at, the psychological aspect of how can you motivate and get the best out of this player, but also from a social point of view of how can you get to know them and how do you protect them within a footballing environment and a duty of care. So I think that's probably adapted to some extent that way and, and that outlook towards those areas seems more relevant from those experiences. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I give you an example. I, I coached a young man um, in the Cayman Islands, and, and he'll know he'll know I'm speaking about him. So I'll say his name. His name's Finnegan, um, and he grew up with Colombian parents um, and very very small house he grew up in um, in the Cayman Islands, and and he, he worked so hard. Bless him. He had such a difficult upbringing. And everything was very tough for him, and he worked really hard. And just coincidence, the people that. Um, I was working for at the time we went to a tournament with the club alongside the business that we worked for and he wanted to come and we found an under 19 guest team he could play for so he went and played for an american team in this tournament in uh, minnesota and complete coincidence a college scout was watching and they offered him an opportunity to come to college and he's now living in minnesota he's got his degree he's played in the usl too and like that's brilliant 
and that makes me so proud in place of and that doesn't mean I'm not really proud of the boys who I worked with in Norway who are now playing playing in the elite series and in the top tier there but that feeling of seeing Finnegan with his daughter now and his life there and playing football in the USL and having a job and he's really took himself from a difficult environment and he's made something really positive of his life um that that's the one that you go yeah and there's other boys in the Cayman Islands as well um for example I name him Jonah played for the national teams back in the national team now but he's now coaching and I'm like wow that, that's special one of the players I've worked with has now gone on to be a coach and he calls me and we text and he asks oh what do you think to this what do you think to that that's the area where I get the most reward as a coach and Yes, the wind feels good for 24 hours, but the feeling when I think of those guys, that, that won't go, that won't move. And uh, that's the best part. Has that shifted maybe your outlook towards coaching then in, in terms of how you define success? Because from that perspective, you, you're seeing the individuals from a, a human nature and appreciating their journey and what they have become. But as mentioned you know, coaches can fixate and on winning all the time and wanting to to have extrinsic rewards because it looks good on them. How, how, how do you balance that? How do you define positivity there within your practice? Because there's so many different aspects as as we've spoken about. How, how do you outlook? What is your outlook towards that? And has that been redefined through these experiences in the Cayman Islands, in Norway, and 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 in Netherlands now? I think if you look at the best, best, best coaches, they're doing it. I think you watch Klopp, his relationship with the players. I think you watch Pep, his relationship with the players. They're doing it. They're making their people better. They're making their players better as footballers, but also as people. Um, the growth in certain people, I think a perfect example right now is Darwin Nunez. What a start to the season for him. But you've seen his confidence and the way he is as a human growing. And there hasn't been that problem between him and Klopp visibly where they don't like each other or there's been a fight, that it's a supportive, hey, you might not be there yet, we're gonna get you there relationship. And I don't think it's I don't think they're separable. I don't think you can say, right, I'm a purely performance winning coach. I'm just about winning. You can be a performance winning coach and still care about your players and still care about the environment you create and making them the best they can be and and creating an environment of um trust, care and allowing them to be themselves without being scared of failure and if they fail they fail so it whatever happens they fail but then you're there to pick them back up and push them again to the next level um i think that 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 really is success and whether that is and i think pep and jürgen will probably feel the same when you watch it if they're going to be successful it might not be that they're successful at Liverpool or city but if they go on to have a successful career i think they'd feel the same the same happiness and pride for them as they do if they go on to win for, for Liverpool and City. Do you think that's a problem at Chelsea potentially at the minute in terms of that human approach and, you know, there's so much different players coming in and there seems to be maybe a lack of camaraderie connection and, and that's taken time with the different managers. And again, I'm just on your point because I'm intrigued how you mentioned Liverpool City and then in contrast to that, you see issues with Chelsea around players performing really well at other clubs and coming in and, necessarily settling effectively and different different types of international players different uh, age scales as well I'm intrigued on what you think on that yeah it's it's about keeping a group together and adding two or three players each year otherwise you upset the balance too much Chelsea are going to be a year or two away from having something and if they buy if try and buy their way out of trouble in January they'll put themselves back another six months they have to and and they have to trust Pochettino. Pochettino is a fantastic manager. You saw what he did at Tottenham, but he did the same thing at Tottenham as Pep and Jürgen Klopp have done at, uh, at Liverpool and City. At Spurs, he kept with the same group. He didn't change it too much. One or two players every year. Keep the group the same. Be smart. Make sure you give your best players the most time, but also rotate enough to be able to have your best team playing as much as possible um, instead of having lots of injuries. And, and that's maybe where... Klopp's learned in the last few years but then you look at Chelsea now and I read the piece on the Athletic about them 44 players at one point I believe it was in a training session so they could play 2 11 v 11 side by side um, so they had to take players from 23s and there wasn't enough room in the changing room so new signings uh, for 80 million euros were changing in the hallway 
or in a broom cupboard. Yeah, this is one of the best clubs in the world. They've won two, they're the champions of Europe and you have players changing in the hallway. That's not going to make you feel valued. That's not going to make you feel cared for. That's not going to make you feel like I'm a really important part of this club. Just just on that then, you mentioned uh, different managers and uh, different ways that you educate yourself. You mentioned the athletic and, and other tools um, that you that you use. How do you keep on top of latest trends then? Is there anything that you and your football club now, PSV, do to, to stay on top of uh, different methods, different styles to get the best out of their players and produce players for, for the first team and potentially across Europe? I'm, I'm intrigued on how you stay on top of your game in terms of knowledge and, and understanding of football. Yeah, I think I'm fortunate to have a really good coaching staff that I work with. I'm the assistant this year to a very, very good young coach. Um, and I'm learning a lot from him because he's worked in top environments already. He's worked in the Champions League already, and, and, and you can see that in the way he is. So I'm learning a lot from him. Um, so that's kind of an informal sort of process. It's sink or swim, um, and I hope I'm swimming. Um, but it's really, really intense. Um, so, and I'd say as well, and I think I do my girlfriend's head in with this, but I probably watch a game a day uh, minimum. Um, Passively or actively, sometimes it's on in the background. So, for example, last night the Dutch uh, were playing against England. So it was England versus Netherlands in the women's football. I was passively watching that because I was doing something else on my laptop. But then also, if you talk about watching a game actively, we played Vitesse with our 18s yesterday. So I was on the side actively watching that game. Um, and then today, Liverpool play Leicester. I will watch that. Um, tomorrow, there'll be a game that I'll watch Friday night. Uh, under 23s play so I'll be watching that uh, so there, there's always nearly every day a game that I'm watching um, or part of at least actively and I think that constantly brings you into environments where you're watching something different tactically something different technically and I come away with most games from ah okay that's interesting I could do that next time or I would have done that differently and a little piece of learning for myself um, I think one of the most interesting games this season and I watch every Liverpool game as a fan um, but I also then get drawn into the a lot to the psychological side with, with Liverpool rather than I watch the tactical side of City a lot more but I think that the psychological social element of Liverpool is much more interesting the way they managed the game when they went down to 10 men against Newcastle that was fascinating I thought that was brilliant and they lose Van Dijk their leader their captain how do they come back in that situation Poor, that was so so interesting and then wait their moment and when it comes they bring Nunez on and he has that sort of cold, cool, calm thing and uh, to score those two goals and I think if that's in a non-supportive environment where he's been cast uh, chastised for his, his way of playing in the last season and he's missing his chances, blah, 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 blah doesn't score those two chances but because he's in that supportive environment he scores those two goals and so that's kind of the uh, areas. Maybe I don't watch every game the same way, but I watch them for different reasons. And are you observing? Are you making notes during that process? Are you focusing on certain parts of, of the game? I'm just intrigued because there might be listeners or viewers watching this that want to think about how they can become better. They're thinking about maybe traveling, but also getting better in terms of understanding the technical, technical, tactical, you mentioned social, psychological as well. Is, is there any apparatus you use to, to ensure that that is, that knowledge sticks in that stage and you reply it maybe short term, but even maybe long term as well? I think this annoys my girlfriend as well, but I've always got a notebook with me. Um, right. so it's, there's always a pen and a notepad somewhere in the apartment, clean up, put it away. Um, but if I have an idea, I always write it down and it's there. So I won't actively watch a game with my notepad and pen there, but it's in front of me on the table or it's somewhere around. So I can always pick it up and write it down if I want to. And sometimes it's in my head. Sometimes I make a note on my phone. Um, sometimes I'll just be texting someone and go, Hey, did you see this? Blah, blah, blah. And it, it comes through. So my notes and my ideas are scattered. It's a little bit of a web. And then I have to try and put them together. Do I put them together? No. Um, but they always make an in. Uh, an indent in my brain and there's always something in my brain which makes me go this is good this is uh something i want to use in the future so if i talk about technical tactical i was 
really interested when Fabian Delft came in as left back for City. So I watched five games of City just to work out well, why are they doing this because it was the first time I'd really seen an inverted fullback used to real success. I'd seen it used, but it was just okay. This was real success, and well, this is different. And then um, Dortmund, when they first came through with Klopp, watching their press, they went from a diamond, then they went into a 4-2-3-1, and they could change their press instantly. Why do they do this? This is interesting. Mourinho, his ability to coach in a low block, um, even going back to his stage at Inter Milan, I still watch some of those games back and go... That's uh, that. That's not tactical. That's something within the brain and within the social psychological, which is different. Uh, that you could get in any way of playing that he had with those players. Uh, and then it's about building those blocks. What can we, what can we use from that at PSV and with the teams that I work with to be successful? And uh, and and at PSV we have quite a prescribed way of playing and the way we want to develop things, which is good. But then we also have the understanding that in the last three years we've had now three different coaches for the first team. So then we're going to have to try and make a player fit to a 4-4-2 um, press in, um, or a 4-2-4 or whatever you want to call it under Roger Smith. And then the next year we're going to play 4-2-3-1 or a 4-3-3. And then this year we're going to play with 1-1-6 one, one, and 4-3-3, high pressure, man-to-man all over the pitch. So three different approaches in three seasons. How are we preparing players for that within our academy and giving them the correct education to, um, to do that? So watching lots of different styles and different ways of playing is, is really important. Just on that then, Jack, so how do you find a balance from your personal perspective in terms of resting and, and trying not to avoid burnout? If, if football football um, is intense, it's, it's fast-paced, uh, it's on all the time, you're surrounded by it all the time, what do you do to, to, to maybe switch off from training or switch off from... from um, you know, watching games or, or kind of in it, it, seeing it as a more of an enjoyable perspective. Because the reason I say that, I had a spell a couple of years back at West Brom, and my social life would be me going to watch a, a team in the West Midlands. And it's just, I couldn't get away from football. It was on constantly. I was working in it. My social life was around it. What strategies or tips do you use to maybe have a break from? from the game to, to to maybe redefine your outlook and, and, and reflect and apply and, and present yeah, again. Yeah, pick up a hobby that you can do with your partner, that you can do with <laughs> your partner. I think it's really important or with a really close friend because otherwise you're on your own and when you're on your own, you're thinking about it. Um, and that's the truth. Your, your, your head is on to football or on to sport or on to psychology. So an example, the last international break was the 9th and 10th of September. So what's that? It doesn't feel like two and a half weeks ago. It feels about three months ago. Um, but I, my girlfriend was away. She was working away um, for the weekend. So what did I do on the Friday night? I watched New Zealand versus France in the rugby because I thought that was fascinating. What did I do on the Saturday? I watched the Grand Prix qualifying. What did I do on Sunday? I watched the Formula One and then I watched another rugby game. Um, I watched the international football as well. So then I didn't get a break. <laughs> um, but then when I'm there, the other things I do is I'm trying... And I've been really good at it up until this last week. We went to the um, we went to London for the youth league game, and we also had we've had we, we we play Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, and Tuesday right now. So there isn't much time, but I try to go to the gym minimum of three times, four times a week. Lift some weights, do some cardio. I enjoy that; makes me feel good. Makes me feel like I'm getting better in another area of my life. Um, and then, as much as possible, the Sunday. I try and keep it as non-football as possible. Go to the gym, make some food, go on a walk, stay away from it. If Liverpool are on, I will turn it on exactly on kickoff. At half time, I'll go and do something else for 15 minutes and then I'll watch the second half and then that's it. I put it down. But yeah, I think um, having things away from football that you actually actively participate in is good because if you go, oh yeah, I... I I like I like going out to eat. Well, you can't do that four times a week. You know, there has to be something which you commit to three or four times a week, which you're away from football and you focus on something else, which you can have fun with someone else. Otherwise, and it's got to be someone away from the, the sport. Otherwise, you're, you're done. You're just going to talk about football all day, every day. 
yeah, it's just an interesting point of view because, uh, again, I'm reflecting on my time and even even observing other coaches, there seems to be a, a, a period of, of, of burnout because it's that consistency and that, that I don't know if the, this is the right word to, to, to say, but like that rat race of, of, of trying to become a good coach, trying to be good. And there's ambition and there's there's the opportunity to, to thrive, but there also needs to be a balance. And I think sometimes that is uh, that's not taught at universities. That's not that that's just taught through experience. And uh, and being aware of that is important. And it's it's refreshing to hear that you you kind of do appreciate that. Yeah, there was a period when I was in Norway, and my first year in Norway, I, I worked a ridiculous amount of hours. I was working 70, 80 hours a week. Um, I was coaching two teams, um, working in their foundation phase, four days, five days a week. I was an assistant coach of a team as well. Yeah, I never got a day off. I never did anything. It, it, it just completely burnt me out. I was done. Uh, by the end of the season, I was I was a shell. I was just making my way to work and then leaving again. Um, and I was finding some time in the morning to run 20 minutes three times a week, and that was my time. So I had an hour, basically a week to do what I wanted to do. And I wasn't earning enough to have a nice life away from it. So that was really, really difficult. And I think once I got through that, I appreciated how important it was to have those breaks and those little bits of time to come back on myself um, and really understand who I am and what I want to do with myself um, to keep my energy high. That helps. And, and yeah, that don't. I don't, I'm not embarrassed in saying I've speak, spoken to therapists and things like that about it because it got really difficult and I found it really, really hard. And fortunately, the, the COVID break came at a really good time for me to appreciate do I actually really want to do this 24 um, 7? Or am I making myself worse at my job by doing this 24 7? And the answer is yes, I'm making myself worse by doing it 24 7. So I need to find an outlet or something to give myself a release. To make sure when I'm there for eight, nine hours a day, they get the best Jack eight, nine hours a day instead of a half cooked Jack who's just surviving on 60%. So, so one thing that I wanted to ask towards the final end of the, the podcast was around PSV and the academy um, that you currently at the moment. What, what's, what's been the ambition to, to, to work in the Netherlands and uh, how has it shaped you as, as a coach in your current role? Yeah, no, it's, it's it's challenging every day, is what I'd say. I'm um, I'm one of two um, international coaches in uh, in the club, uh, or I should I should say in the academy. Um, and you can count the third if you count our, our head coach. His dad's German um, for the, the for the 18th, uh, but he gets it. That's really good for me. You know, I, you can understand an international perspective, which is great. And uh, we have a Ghanaian coach as well, Eric, who's played for the first team. So he's a little bit of a different case to me. I'm the one coming in with fresh eyes and I've only been in the country for two years. So it's, it's a big challenge. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think as, as an education, I think you can look at the clubs in the Netherlands and you can go, oh, it'd be great to work for Ajax and things like that. I disagree. Um, I think being the one who's always fighting, and that's what we are, we're the underdogs a little bit in this. Um being the one who's always fighting to try and prove themselves and succeed, that's really good fun. Um, and we always see ourselves a little bit as hard done by uh, when we've got to work out how we're going to be successful and, and, and do better than the people that get more acclaimed banners within the country. And um, that's, that's a really nice challenge. And I really enjoy being part of that challenge and having a big role in that challenge and working with it every day. The players are much, much, much different to what you'd experience in England, what you'd experience in Norway. Uh, the attitude they have is, is very, very different. Um, we also have to consider that I'm working with the 18s, 19s now, so it's a combined age group. Uh, but the 19s train with young PSV, which play in professional football. So we have two teams in professional football, PSV 1 and, and young PSV. Um, so we're having players that are playing professional football and then they come back to us to go and play 18s football where there might be 100 people around the around the pitch if you're lucky said so how do you manage that they play one week they play against Thurnock and away 20,000 people wow that's great but then the next day like last night so a week later or eight days after playing against Thurnock 
we're playing against fifty people, uh, playing in front of fifty people against Vitesse under nineteen. It's a big challenge. That's a big challenge to to change the mindset. So it's a very very different challenge to what you'd experience in England. Um, I think the Papa John's thing in England is very good for the under twenty ones to understand what first team football looks like. We have that bridge already. Um, so so you know, it's, it's, it being the only non Dutch person or the only one that's international fresh on the scene as myself it's it's a big challenge every time I'm there but I really enjoy it what advice would you give to a coach wanting to experience a different way in comparison to maybe England or the UK what advice would you give to someone that has got that ambition similar to yourself um, but don't really necessarily know how to go around it but what, what would what would your tips be on that First thing is get a degree, um, and it sounds really boring, get administrative, but it is the truth. For for you to get a, a visa now in many countries, a degree is the minimum you need to get a visa. Um, and post Brexit, it is necessary in the EU to have a, a, a degree to work in the EU. In ninety percent of the countries, if you want to work in a decent level, you have to have a degree. So I would say that um, be open. Um, to the challenges i think every single country i've worked in norway netherlands cayman islands i've had that moment at six months of i'm done with this i want to go back to england i want the easy route i want comfort and that happens and you have that week and then at the end of the week usually something happens where you go well oh, i won't get this in england i won't get this experience i won't i won't feel this uncomfortable this is growth this is where it's really difficult for me and i've got to get better and I think you've got to get through that period and I see several coaches and uh, and they go and do these things abroad and they're home within three months and I go, that's the hard bit. Once you get through that, then you get the real rewards and you have to be able to stick in there and, and dig into the difficult bit to get the rewards. And if you don't dig in, then you're going to go back to the same place. And when it gets difficult in England, what are you going to do? Are you going to quit your job there? So that that's the resilience part. That's really difficult and yeah. I completely um, empathize with you if you're there. And if ever anyone wants to message me about that and you're in that period, I can talk to you about how I dealt with it, no problem. Um, but it is a lot of get up the next day and do it and stay in the routine. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, and I think I've inadvertently done this really well, um, is create a social media brand for yourself. I never did it on purpose. Um, I did it because I was interested in it. Um so, for example, during COVID, I just put out some... I watched all the Man City games from the first half of the season because I was fascinated with them. And particularly the way they built up with three, I thought, this is different. I haven't seen this properly before. Um, so I, I did a big report on it and put it on Twitter. And yeah, then the coach from PSV saw it. And that was how my link came into PSV. So then my social media brand, without me knowing, had become quite strong and 6,000 people were seeing my tweets and then retweeting it or liking it or favoriting it or whatever it was at that moment. And I got really fortunate that someone important had seen it. So those little things that people um, don't think are important, oh, I'm not going to do that, I look too busy, blah, blah, blah. No, it's really good because you get recognized and also you get some good feedback on your work. Yeah, really interesting that. I, I like that how that, that's come about and the power of social media. A lot of people are sceptical of social media, but actually in that instance, it shows and displays you as an individual, but also gives you opportunity. So uh, I think that's valuable. My, my final question, Jack, is um, very much around you as an individual. And um, what I tend to do with my guests is either get them to look back or look forward. But I think because of where you are where you are in your development and your uh, ambitions and your outlook towards the world through your experiences i want to ask you where do you think you will go in terms of your coaching where do you see yourself being in the future is there anything that you have a, an ambition to achieve is there anything that you've set a goal for yourself that you want to do i'm intrigued on where you might be with that yeah, well, the, the the big, hairy, audacious goal is to win the Champions League and it won't be anything else. I'm a Liverpool fan. Europe is the ultimate. It is the ultimate. I hear that. It, I think even if I stand on the touchline, it's like, 
the real gold and I can hear that Champions League anthem, I'll be like, wow, this is special. I felt it the other week when we were um, even in the youth league against uh, Arsenal. I felt it like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is a step closer to where I really, really want to be. And I think, I think that would be a really big goal of mine to coach in Europe. I'd love to be a head coach in Europe, but um, I think that's, I don't know, that's a really big goal. It's very difficult. It's something that's not easy to attain, but it's something I believe that I can get to with the with the work ethic and the way I am. Um, but then also there's the goal of really just seeing where my players go. And that when I was 22, 23, and I'm still very young, I'm 29, I'm 30 in November, I'm still a baby in coaching terms. And I know that. And I came in at 22, 23, and I know at 35, 36, I'll have a completely different perspective to what I have now. That's the beauty of it. I'm growing, I'm changing. But at 22, 23, all I was interested in was that European trophy and, and that was where I was going to go. I was going to be a first team manager in the Premier League by 30 and all of these silly, ambitious goals, which are great because they push you. Um, but now I look back and like I said earlier, things that give me most pride are those boys that have gone on to be successful. And I think if there's a, not, if there's a goal of something I'd love to do in the future, it would be, um, it would be to, to, to just do a project and take a project where I can make a big difference as well. So I don't think necessarily I'm always going to look at the Premier League, the Championship, the Eredivisie, the Bundesliga as my end goal. I want to do it. and I want to coach it. I want to feel that pressure. I want to feel that week to week, that European cycle. I want to feel it. Whether I'm an assistant coach or head coach, I want it. But I also want that to go and be the Cayman Islands national team head coach for a year and I want to feel that difference you can make to human beings and the way the world is and, and the, the experiences they have from five years old as they're born uh, from the difference when they're born to five years old on the island their introduction to football to the top level national team for that island and you can make a difference for the future of people um, so I think there's like two things there and that doesn't mean they're mutually exclu exclusive you can professionalize the environment on the island 100% you can also empathize and create a more soft environment in top level sport so people develop as well and um, yeah so it's a long it's a long answer to that but champions league fantastic but also let's make people better and and be involved in their life in the long term love that jack and where can listeners find you you mentioned uh, you're happy to give advice. Where, yeah, where can people Twitter connect with you? And, and I get a lot of media to it as well. Um, I apologize if people I don't respond get you on, online. Um, Christy knows I'm bad at responding. The reality is I get Wednesday off and it's Wednesday morning <laughs> and this is the time that I respond to my Twitter messages if I have them. Um, so I set an hour aside <laughs> to do that on a Wednesday and sometimes I won't because sometimes with respect, the, the questions I can't answer. It's impossible. Can I get a trial at PSV? No, I can't do that for you, for example. So, um, but if you come with something, you need some help, you need some advice, and you can give me a really detailed question of what you need advice with. I've responded to many coaches. I've had phone calls <laughs> with many coaches. I'm happy to do that, but don't, oh, how do I become a coach? Uh, that's hmm, something specific. I'm more than happy to help. LinkedIn is good as well. Um, I'll respond and talk there. Um, and if you want to meet me in person, um, we have the PSB Coaching Academy on LinkedIn. You can find that. And we have open days um, three times every year. So three two-day periods. And you can come and visit the club. And that's where I'm two days purely on coach development from the outside. Um, so I'll talk you through our way of working with the 18s, our way of working in the academy. You can watch the 23s play in their uh, second division game. And I'm there to have good discussions. And we had four sets last year. And if you ever want reviews, I can put you in touch with people that are. That is where I'm, I come alive for two days in helping coaches from outside. So if you're interested in that, check out the BSB Coaching Academy on LinkedIn. We'll put all the links to your social media as well as the, the BSV Academy in the description. So if anyone's listening or watching, they can click that and, and have a look and uh, speak to yourself if they, if they feel that's relevant. Um, Jack, I just want to say thank you for your time. Obviously, being a busy person and you're setting your Wednesdays aside. Um, obviously, you've set aside some time for me. So I just want to say thank you for that. And also, good luck with the future. I love your ambition. I love your drive. I love your determination. 
your ability to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, whether that's within your coaching role, but also maybe f- putting yourself in different countries where you learn and develop yourself is a, is a great asset. And like I said, it's not learn at universities. I think that comes within. Um, and I think that's very inspirational for many listeners or viewers um, listening to this podcast. So just want to say thank you for your time and, and good luck. Thank you very much, Christian. I really appreciate it. It's been great to be on and have a good chat this morning.